Hello and welcome to In the Wall with me, Parker Kligerman. This is the show where each week we dive deeper into the hottest topics and conversation in motorsports. Want to be a part of this show? Send us your thoughts, questions, comments using hashtag In the Wall. But this week, we start with big news. An American has won in Europe again. Joe Roberts, who races in the Moto2 class of MotoGP, which is like the Xfinity series of MotoGP, won his first race at the Portimao circuit in Portugal. He is the first American to win in the class since 1990. What uh, Connor Daly, Kevin Harvick, and a few others have been saying is, you know, that the, the, how tough it is for Americans to make it over in Europe. Now, you're in a sport where there have been plenty of uh, successful Americans, um, including now yourself. Um, do you have you noticed anything different about being an American over there, being in the sport? Um, and any uh, is it does it feel any different, or is there any kind of cultural difference? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's huge cultural difference um, with the way that you grew up racing. I mean, I think for the most part, like things, especially for the European riders, I think it's uh, there's more of a structure growing up to be like a motorcycle. Well, especially road racing. Let's just narrow it down to road racing. I think it's there's a lot of infrastructure for young kids, you know, a lot of programs. Uh, um how they get help from the governments uh of their local cities or uh whatever or countries even and uh there's just uh i think can be i don't want to say i guess maybe a little bit easier to fall into it but you're also if i guess if you were a spaniard you'd be you know like up against a bunch of other ones so it's still a hard thing to do but um yeah i think you're just more in the system you know uh the way that things operate in the world championship is just uh it's just a different way you know like it's uh tracks are very different uh bikes are very different grand prix bikes are very different to you know production bikes so there's a lot to adapt to and you don't get to go home every weekend either you know like all these uh european riders they they get to go back to their house that they grew up in or or uh their town they grew up in where you know people like me and Cameron, we have to, you know, set up camp in Barcelona. And, and I mean, I'm gone, I'm gone from about February till July. And then I have a little break and then I go from end of July all the way to November. So it's a huge commitment, you know, and uh, I mean, it's a great life. I'm not complaining at all. I love it. It's a different life, but it's, it's a bit of a, yeah, I don't know. It's just very different in that way. Um, do you feel, uh, any pressure or do you feel the pressure of representing America or the United States on a global stage? I think I did before and maybe in some aspects. Yeah. But I think I put enough pressure on myself to, to achieve what I want in this, in this world of racing. You know, I mean, I guess in some ways it's a bit of a selfish sport because you, you have the things that you want to do and reasons why you're here, you know, is I've been I've been hammering at you know motorcycle racings for a long my whole life you know and uh, I have dreams of my own to to achieve and uh, obviously it's kind of it's an honor to like represent America and and be one of the few Americans here because there's been so few in the last few years so I guess I do feel a little bit of that pressure but um, it's more I guess I just I have things I want to achieve in this in this championship and. Uh, I'd be bummed if I got to the end of my career and I didn't achieve the things I wanted to, you know? Over on four wheels, another American is making waves in Europe as Logan Sargent, who races in the F2 series, which is like the Xfinity series of F1, was in second position at the feature race at Imola when he went off the track and ultimately finished a strong seventh. Love to see him up front and we hope to get him on the show ASAP as we are always rooting for the Americans abroad. Keep it up, Logan. On the other side of the world, in Japan, their premier single-seater series called Super Formula, say that five times fast, trialed a hybrid body panel that is made of, get this, from a mix of natural hemp fiber and carbon fiber. I won't make jokes about what happens when race cars do what they do, where they light on fire. I'm not making that joke. This is me not making that joke. IndyCar announced changes to the Indy 500 qualifying format that centers around making the fight for pole even more exciting by aligning it more with their formats at other races. Essentially, it goes all the way down to a Firestone Fast 6 late in the second day to see who can get the pole and to set the rows, the front two rows. That's going to be awesome because it's already one of the most exciting qualifying formats in the world, and the drama is already high. 
Uh, on Tuesday, Junior Motorsports announced it will field a fifth car in five additional Xfinity Series races this season, driven by Hendrick Motorsports Cup drivers William Byron, Chase Elliott, and Kyle Larson, with sponsorship from HendrickCars.com. Just like we've seen those drivers in that Spire Motorsports truck. And remember how there's like a super condensed practice design in Cup and all the series now? Extra track time, maybe? Hmm. Hey, if you're watching this show, you are in good company. Because Cup Series winner Denny Hamlin liked the segment and reached out to me on Twitter to talk about it, about when we dissected the cost of NASCAR truck racing. Then he had a little bit of questioning about uh, how does the prize money work in trucks? Because he has also been very vocal, now that he's an owner, about the economic struggles of being a cup owner at the top level. Uh, also, Daytona 500 champion Austin Sindrick was the only person to catch my horrible attempt at a Jeremy Clarkson of Top Gear fame in the world. That was just bad once again. What is wrong with you? All right, let's do a little tech minute, or as we like to call this one, breakdown of my tweet over the weekend on how the brake, ah, I get that, is the most powerful tool available to a race car driver on a super speedway. I know this sounds odd because a super speedway is all about going flat out and reading the air, which it is, but the brake is how you make runs to be able to pass or make sure you're being pushed. It all boils down to something we learned during the tandem era, which is called bumper pressure, where you use the brake to help the car behind break through that bubble of air and keep pushing you forward. And you can also use the brake to sort of regulate how hard they're pushing you so it doesn't propel you too far forward. And that is the basis of how we ended up tandem drafting, which led to a lot of teams back then having to put larger brakes in the cars because we were using the brakes so much and that sort of led towards what got away from that. Now that isn't the case these days of using large brakes, but you can use the brake at the right times to make a pass or create a run which if you look at the end of this past weekend's race, when Eric Jones, that 43 car, got so far out ahead of the five car, if he had maybe used the brake just a little differently through turns three and four, he wouldn't have gotten so far away from that five car and possibly had an entirely different outcome at the end of that race. That is how you use the brake to your advantage at a super speedway. Right, this coming weekend, we have NASCAR at Dover, IndyCar with a sold out crowd at Barber Motorsport Park, and IMSA at Laguna Seca. Yet, much of the internet will be talking about the Miami Grand Prix. You're going to hear all about the celebrities going, the huge parties, and of course, the insanely high ticket prices. Like this tweet I got today from Ryan Terpstra after asking, what should we talk about on today's show? He said, ticket prices for the Miami GP that's upcoming, or maybe the fake marina slash yacht club. I'm just here for the chaos. I know you all want me to make all of the jokes but the thing is, I love seeing F1 have a moment here in the USA. I love seeing motorsports garner all this attention. But I do have a problem when a sport that so desperately wanted US attention and now has it is going to purposely close itself off during one of its rare US appearances. The thing is, the Monaco GP is exclusive because it has to be. There's barely any more room to have more people attend or fit more yachts. But when you announce a new race, a clean sheet of paper, and are building the track in a parking lot, you could have done anything. When hundreds of thousands showed interest, you could have said, great, let's fit everyone we possibly can, but instead to build a fake marina, numerous VIP sections, and have tickets in the four figures, you've lost the point. Yes, there will be endless Rolexes, Santal perfume, and espresso martinis all over Instagram, and it'll be a huge success. It's just a shame when the real metric for success could have been less style and more substance. If you agree, let me know. I'm sure if you disagree, you'll let me know. All I know is, and then there's this. As always, this show is all about you. So send us your questions throughout the season on social media at hashtag in the wall, and I might just answer it like these comments from all over last week. Uh, especially on YouTube, where many of you talked about how you're watching or re-watching NASCAR because of the schedule diversity, which is what we talked about. And that's awesome. Welcome or welcome back. Um, I love to see that because we take these things from the internet, we think of the conversation, and then you guys confirm it with comments like that. Pretty awesome. We also had less than complimentary ones like this one from Meow Listen here on Instagram. I completely skipped watching it. Dirt is for people not good enough for NASCAR, it's local nobodies. It's like high school baseball. 
Don't agree with that. There's a lot of top level stuff. Also on Instagram, Clint Little said, leave the dirt in the cow fields. That's not correct. The dirt came from just outside the racetrack there in Bristol, predominantly. Uh, and then lastly, on TikTok, you guys were a little nicer. Double Stuff Gaming said, I feel like F1 at Martinsville would be funny. I agree. That would be hilarious. We've actually done that on Moon Car before. Guess what? Use hashtag in the wall or hit me directly on Twitter or Instagram at Pete Klingman. Be a part of this show. Ask us questions. Send us your rants. We want to see you here. And definitely tune in for more stuff I couldn't remember. Uh, guys, so I have some jokes I'd like to try for the Miami segment. Let me just try them out here. Um, Chase Private Client offered to sponsor the weekend, but the organizers didn't like the name they wanted, which was always helping with Trust Fund's Grand Prix. The organizers have announced they're offering a special ticket for anyone who has attended more than four Coachellas and also make sure to only call it Cella. The Rolex section has a special ticket for those that can prove their family bought them the watch and in no way did they buy it with their own money. I like this one. They announced a new section at the Miami Grand Prix. The do you know who my dad is VIP section. Hmm. These aren't good. Guys, they're not going to let us go with these. Do not do it.